So but let me introduce Sandy Walker, uh, my father, dad, uh, to you all here to, to say some words about his art and, and welcome you here today. Dad, are you able to get off mute? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Noah, that was great. And I really appreciate it, as you know. Uh, and uh, actually, Noah said a few of the things I was gonna say in the beginning, uh, but I wanna welcome everyone and thank all of you for coming to this uh, virtual event, which uh, is, first of all, in place of, the exhibit at the show gallery, but now the show gallery, as Noah said, is open and you can physically go in on a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from uh, 11 to 5. And uh, the uh, and, and it will be appropriately spaced, not too many people at any one time. But at any rate, I very much appreciate your coming and I also appreciate the fact that COVID has created this new medium and I can share my work with many of you that <clears throat> cannot come in person because you're too far away or whatever. So with all that said, thank you and welcome. And uh, I, most of you, I think, know me already, but I will... Um, tell you a little bit about myself, my background, and how and why I do my work. Uh, and then I will talk specifically about the work in the show. So, um, you know, I am Sandy Walker. And I was born and raised in Washington, DC, a city with great art museums. At an early age, I learned to love art and specifically painting at the National Gallery of Art, the Phillips Collection, and the Freer Gallery. Oh, <laughs> you see that, Noah? Yeah. Any rate, <clears throat> are we okay, Noah? Yeah, all good. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Any rate, as I was saying, I, I attended elementary and high school uh, in Washington at St. Albans, which had a wonderful art program taught by Dean Stambaugh. I had four years of college at Harvard majoring in art history. And uh, then um, uh, four years of art school, uh, majoring in painting basically, and uh, ending up with a MFA at Columbia University. Um, I actually failed to mention about Washington DC and I wanna go back for a second that it was very important to me that I grew up in a city with great art museums. And um, that includes the National Gallery, the Phillips Collection and um, the Freer Gallery, which I was very fortunate to be exposed to at a very early age and where I learned to love art and specifically painting. Um, I am deeply indebted to my teachers. Um, after Dean Stambaugh, there was Morton Sachs, Walter Murch, Nick Caroni, Mercedes Matter, Stephen Green, John Helliker, Siong Moy, and Tony Harrison. They're all teachers that I had at one time or another to whom I am deeply indebted. Uh, since graduating, I've had many one-person shows at both private galleries and museums. Examples of my work are represented in many major, major museums and public collections, including the Museum of Modern Art, New York, the Smithsonian Museum of American Art, the Whitney Museum, uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Achenbach Collection in San Francisco, and locally, the Berkeley Art Museum. When I graduated from Columbia, I was strictly an abstract painter, 
my earliest mature work was abstract to the extreme. This is an example of the work that I was doing uh, as I emerged from graduate school, which was one color paintings, large and in various sizes. Um, this was, I have to say, much more unusual in those days than it is now. It's a common genre, but at that time, my teachers weren't totally happy with me taking my work to this extreme. But what I was doing is taking abstraction to an extreme. And um, that's where I started out doing in my mature work. Then after I graduated, um, I was living in the Vietnam War era. And I found that my work does not really reveal or reference the things that I was thinking about or feeling or trying to communicate. And as a result, I moved my work into an area that I would describe as on the edge between abstraction and representation. I introduced references to subject or scene reality without being descriptive or narrative, whereas I like to say competing with photography. So all this leads me to the work of my show today. I use abstraction, and yet there is a reference so that the viewer might know what my paintings are about. My large painting, I Am the Raft of the Medusa, in the show today, is inspired by the great painting by Theodore Jericho, The Raft of the Medusa, that hangs in the Louvre. So why do I not simply represent, copy, or depict the painting? First of all, my means is expressive. I use the materials in an expressive manner. Also, I want to say here what it is about abstraction that continues to fuel my work. Abstraction is also a revelation of the mystery and power of the painting media. I am referring to the power of the picture plane, the colors, the quality of the paint itself. What has held my attraction to pure abstraction is its ability to open us to the inner, the inner life, or if I dare say, the ineffable. That is the magic of our craft. I could say that ordinary speech, words, do not serve to convey this kind of experience from one mind to another. I start with an inspiration, an idea, not necessarily a preconceived final image. I do small works and drawings, and then larger drawings leading to the final painting. I have included in the show examples of all these phases of my work were leading to the large final painting of the raft. This process is an example of uh, my working process that I have followed throughout my lifetime of painting. As I follow this creative process, the work evolves in form and content. I greatly admired Jericho's painting in the Louvre while I lived in Paris from 80 to 82. That's me in an earlier body <laughs> on our visit to Paris. Uh, <clears throat> I tried my own earlier version of the painting while I was in Paris in, in the, in the 80 to 82. And over the years since then, it has remained at the top of, the, of my list of the very greatest paintings. I cannot take time here to analyze all the reasons, but I can say Jerimo, Jericho's masterpiece has remained with me all these years. When the World Trade Center was attacked, Jericho's painting became for me a symbol of our time. 
the orange light lines on the horizon of my painting represent the World Trade Center. I have posted in the gallery a longer explanation of Jericho's raft and its history, and I will post that on the website of the show gallery also. My many years of working with the landscape has provided me with the language and ammunition to express my meaning in this painting. In the gallery, you can see one of my earlier paintings from nature. This is entitled Tree Earth. I hope you can see how the power of nature has been incorporated into my language. Other works in the show also deserve uh, my words, but I want to make time for our invited guests to have their say, my invited speakers. So I would simply like to add a few words of explanation about a couple of the paintings. Pina, Trisha Vajavik was inspired by the film Pina with choreography by Pina Bausch, as well as by movement by Patricia Brown, interpreted by Vicky Schick, New York dancer and friend. I would simply like to add by way of explanation uh, also that the larger woodblock print entitled Parsifal and Desire grew out of my year-long contemplation of the myth of Parsifal and his search for the Holy Grail. The print Rima is a reference to William Hudson's novel, Green Mansions. And adolescence has its origins and inspiration in Edvard Munch's painting, Puberty. So now I want to turn it over to um, my invited speakers. I, I um, asked each one of them to visit the gallery and see the work in person, and then to speak uh, about their response to the work in whatever way they want. All of them are friends of mine and professionals are very well established in their own rights. I won't go into detail about each one of their backgrounds since we have placed information about each one of them in the chat, but I recommend that you look and you will see um, their great works and their accomplishments also. And so I'm gonna turn this over to Hearn Pardee, uh, artist, educator, and art writer who will speak first. So there you go, Hearn, you're next, thank you. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you, Sandy. Um, and hello, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, I'm uh, a little here, Sandy said, well, I'll talk for five minutes. So I'll try and see what I can put together coherently. But um, just watching the, the slides and thinking about um, Sandy's experience in Paris, I should say that uh, my own experience uh, as an American painter has always involved trips to Europe. And we spent a lot of time uh, my wife, Gina Werfel, and I in Paris uh, with students, and um, I've been deeply involved with uh, Jericho and that particular painting. We've taken our paint, painting students there on summer trips for a number of years and always make them go to that gallery and draw from the raft of the Medusa. Um, but I should also say that my, uh, my connections with Sandy go back also to uh, my years in New York and early uh, experience I had in working from the landscape uh, up the Hudson River near Bear Mountain, uh, where um, I uh, was uh, thrust into this uh, experience of the overwhelming uh, natural landscape. And um, I, was, I had been experienced before painting in the city. And so this was uh, a case of trying to really reorient myself. And at the time I was very preoccupied with the, the sense that um, American art was very different from European art and my own work seemed deficient. I, I didn't feel like I, I had the, the cultural uh, inheritance with me that, that Matisse and Cezanne had had, the artists I admired so much. And so I was constantly kind of going back and forth and looking at the Europeans and then trying to apply that in my work 
Um, and since then, I'd say being in America and painting in the American landscape for a long time, I've, <laughs> I've become more uh, at home with the American landscape and the American tradition, going back to the Hudson River painters and considering not just the, uh, you know, the, the pictures of the landscape so much as the, uh, the tradition, um, the social and cultural tradition that's involved. And, and I've been very involved with people like Alfred Stieglitz, who talked about trying to develop American artists who looked at American subjects. Um, and so <clears throat> watching uh, Sandy's work evolve, um, and now as he's adapted to the West Coast landscape, uh, but thinking about those issues of uh, more than just, uh, you know, making landscape paintings, but thinking about the, uh, the, the whole historical tradition that's in, engaged with that, that was engaged by Americans when they went to the Hudson River and um, has been engaged by people like Morrison Hartley and other artists I've uh, always uh, admired um, who, who tried to uh, interpret the, this idea that, that Stiglitz had was that the American landscape was new and we had to find new ways of approaching it. And I think Sandy's work uh, really exemplifies the idea of finding uh, a, a language, as he calls it, to, um, to interpret the experience that he has uh, and finding in landscape a source for, for subject matter, but really developing the language. And, uh, and so much of his, his language comes through the body. Uh, the great European tradition, of course, is all in the history painting, like Jericho's, and in the human figure. And uh, I know from studying at the studio school where was involved also uh, how much emphasis was placed on the human figure, the model, but the sense of space and uh, the way that we were taught to, um, to get beyond the, the subject and, and enlarge that into a, a larger uh, way of interpreting the forms in front of us. And so, uh, so I think uh, Sandy has really exemplified that thing I was talking about with Stieglitz that you find, a, find your own way of responding to a new landscape, to looking at this uh, experience. And I think, you know, Sandy's engagement with environmentalism and uh, causes, I think there's an implicit political thing in working from observation of things and, and certainly dealing with the environment these days. Um, we're engaged with, uh, I would say, the, you know, the raft of the Medusa to be even more than the World Trade Center. It's involved with the climate crisis and the way that we're all on a raft and we don't know how we're going to get off. <laughs> and so um, anyway, uh, have I gone on for yet? Yeah, <laughs> I've, uh, you know, again, very impressed that Sandy and, and just looking, I hope, I'm sure other people will, will point out some of these same things, just the way his use of dark and light and, you know, that uh, very simple means he's taken with the direct experience of landscape, very simple black and white and figure ground and found ways to elaborate on his uh, images in that way to generate, um, well, I, I was going to say also about the human figure in that is just the experience of dance, which uh, he mentioned, which comes through certainly in those uh, interlocking tree forms and, and the way that they morph into uh, interlocking human bodies. So, uh, so I don't know, that's uh, uh, a brief summary, I guess, of things I thought about in relation to your work. And that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. I don't want to stop you because I know you can talk on, but uh, <laughs> I appreciate that very I'm much. I'm used to these things, you know, so I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. But uh, so thank you. And our next speaker is Janice Plotkin, film historian and filmmaker. And particularly uh, her, her recent film was about the artist Jerry Barish. And I'll turn it over to you, Janice. I made the first faux pas of not unmuting. Thank you so much, Sandy. It's an honor to be included here. And uh, primary work of mine is really looking at visual images which I've been doing for more than 40 years. So I came for um, this prepare, preparation by going to see the show live uh, in person, which was the first public gathering of myself in a, ga in a gallery in more than a year. And that in itself was very exciting and seeing the, uh, the work hung and how it was placed was, um, I thought it was a very exciting show. So that was my, first reaction was I was extremely excited by the energy 
of the show and uh, the way it was curated and the pieces that were included. Um, and I asked the gallerist who was there at the time, is this specifically from 2021? And I was happy to learn that some of the work uh, dated back to the 80s. So there's very common themes uh, that I see now through, uh, through the decades. Um, but there was a kind of feverish and ferocious energy in the work uh, that is to me about, it's about nature, but it's also about the body and the interplay of the body and the trees uh, to me was fascinating because, you know, if you, you know, are just kind of spacing out and gazing at the forest, which I like to do, sometimes you see the movement of the trees and, and they feel like uh, they're dancing. And um, the, the use of color, and I, I happened to be just this week on the Central Coast, and I was looking, driving by uh, the oaks and other trees out on the bluffs and seeing the, the um, dark uh, roots of the trunk of the tree um, easily could look like body. So I just love the idea that you can look at both of those and see them, and I know that Sandy uh, and Ellen have spent their summers up in Washington State uh, uh, so that Sandy's painting in their cabin and a lot of the forest must serve as inspiration um, and going beyond just the trees, not seeing the forest for the trees. Um, so I also see there's a kind of spareness and edginess uh, to the work. And one uh, painting in particular that really moved me was um, I, I think it was a, an early piece, Tree Earth, that drew me into the bark. I, I wanted to look at it, but there was great detail in this massive tree. So I was both engaged in the big picture, but also wanting to look deeper. And uh, Sandy, if that was your intention, I, I, I got it. If not, I'm projecting my own uh, wanting to look at nature deeper. Um, there was also a boldness of color because a lot of what, what I had seen of Sandy's work prior to this as a friend was uh, mostly black or black and white, um, where I was paying attention to um, the negative space. Uh, and in this case, I was paying attention to the color uh, and the boldness of the color and, and how they uh, propelled the storytelling. Uh, the, the one that really moved me was, uh, there were actually three, um, was adolescence um, because there was a dark figure um, which could have been a, now, now that I know you were referencing something else, it's interesting to see. I, I took it as a parent, a parent, oh, there you go. The black, the, for me, the black was a, a parent that was not quite there with the child and the child was feeling detached from the parent and, um, or alienated as, as uh, we often might have been at age 15, as I recall in my own life. Um, so I just saw there was a kind of juxtaposition of need and desire with them, um, uh, uh, perhaps an adult figure that wasn't quite available. Um, I also really love looking at the Pina Trish, Trisha von Vick. The, yeah, I, I'm a fan of the Pina Bausch Dance Company and I saw both the movement of the dancers, but also these splashes of color that uh, electrified the painting. And um, it, it, it electrified the dance actually. And uh, really, really interesting to me. Um, and, or maybe I was talking about forest dance. Okay, forest dance has the electrical, um, yeah, there's the one, okay. Anyway, so the boldness of color and there's the sense that I got was from the work as I'd already mentioned, an invitation to look in deeper, um, to ponder longer, um, to try to see what for me the messaging is. And I, I appreciate uh, abstract art and I, I'm drawn to it uh, from my own sense of trying to interpret it. Um, and the emotional reaction that I get from it. Um, and I do love the interplay of nature and body. Um, and I see that in so much of what you do. The trees is a moving body. Nature's roar uh, in a tree that looked like it was surrounded by coals, old red tree. 
um, that, you know, it was both beautiful and um, fear. I had fear, it created fear because we're living in a, a fire zone where now part of our year is spent worrying about uh, forest fires and smoke. Um, and then there was the forest dance that I realized you just did um, in the last year or so. And it was like a, a conga line. It was like a conga line of dancers, but it was trees. And uh, I just found that as uh, the secret life of trees, when we're not there, this is what they're doing. And um, I, I, I found a lot of pleasure in that. Um, and the last thing that I noticed about the work um, was a kind of detachment, uh, an outsiderness, um, uh, not quite approaching, um, more observational than being in it, I guess. And uh, particularly with the two works, adolescence and male, female. So I, I would say this is the first time I've seen a body of work and I thank you, Sandy, for letting me uh, riff on it because I, I feel like the show works together beautifully in expressing all the things that I just said. And uh, I don't know, I just wanna say congratulations and uh, good job, it's beautiful, very beautiful. And to thank the gallerist for curating a really interesting selection of your work, yeah. Janice, thank you so much. That was wonderful. I treasure it, and uh, I, 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 I'm not going to comment on what everybody says as they say. But I just wanted to add that something I left out from my bio was Washington D.C. was a, a city of museums, and it's also a city of trees. Very special. But <clears throat> thank you so much. That was I treasure that. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Vaughn Satterfield, a wonderful Bay Area painter and longtime educator. And so I'm going to turn it over to you, Vaughn. Thank you very much, Sandy, for your invitation. Can you hear me? OK, great. Um, first, I just want to say um, we lost a great colleague uh, this week, um, Terry St. John, and I just want to mention him and, you know, the effect he had, I think, upon all of us in our group and was certainly missing. So I just want to say that. Okay. Um, considering Sandy's show, being somewhat familiar with Sandy's work, I knew the themes would be drawn from history and nature. My intention was to treat these remarks as an invitation to a larger conversation. To ask, what are the ambiguities for the viewer to respond and reflect on triumphs and failures of individuals and humanity as a whole? Do the perspectives presented here create opportunities for the viewer? If so, how then does this happen? With an open mind, I decided to visit the show on the first day. And I met Julie and her little dog, and that was very nice. My impressions. The Rafa Medusa, the centerpiece of the exhibition, painted by Jericho and reinterpreted by Sandy as a metaphor, and homage to this great painting thrusted itself upon me as I entered the main room. It seemed to fill the entire space. I had seen it once before in Sandy's studio, but seeing it in a smaller space immediately brought its scale into focus and presented an intimate possibility and proposition to me as I determined my proximity physically to the painting and the distance required to see and feel it maximally. It's compelling energy is palpable and certain as it makes demands on the viewer. Also, there were several small works on paper from Sandy's Nature and Tree series. I felt they were overwhelmed 
subordinated by this Raph of Medusa. I thought about this painting historic's relevance as a work of art and footnote to how we, as history, repeat and demonstrate the inability to restrain hubris as an ingrained destructive compulsion. I can see how this painting would inspire, provoke and offer a timeless theme for future generations. The painting is powerful, an art object that does to the senses and intellect what great art does. It suspends disbelief and leaves us profoundly moved by an often unexplainable experience. So, as I moved away from the raft, I walked across the room and sat on the couch, and I saw the room from a different perspective, as other works on, the, on paper declared themselves, not as subordinates to the grand opus that dominated the room, but these works inspired by nature, sublimely resting in an asymmetrical juxtaposition that Medusa gave the gallery a sense of balance. So I paused for a moment and I walked into the second room. I eventually pulled away and walked towards the corner of the second gallery, taking a seat at a small desk that was in the corner of the, of the room. From there, I could see the entire room. There were three large paintings that immediately captured me. The scale and rhythm were a delight as my sight was drawn back and forth as the suggested figuration became pure lines swirling, interlocked, creating a netting set on a pure plane of figure ground relationships. Wow. There were smaller drawings in the room, works on paper, touches of vibrant hues were sensitively and with great economy employed to emphasize the linear quality, reaffirming the figures as muse and medium. Pina Bosch, the blue painting, a radiant blue and black painting of moving vertical, curvilinear shapes interwoven, tints with vitality and gesture. Parsifal in desire, a horizontal woodblock print was strong with a sense that here Sandy's visual vocabulary was obvious, a direct abstract declaration of a very personal aesthetic. The largest work in the room was another version of the Raf, a large ink on paper painting. It was particularly striking and a remarkable extension of the artist's fascination with the figure. Sandish use of line as a means and expression for exploring sensitive relationships between figure and space flowing in and out, building form and allowing the viewer to interpret compose or even reconsider their initial impressions. As I sat, stood and walked through the gallery, I felt the scale of the work shifting and moving, redefining themselves separately and in continually the rhythm of one into the next. It was unsettling, but exciting to behold. Sandy's work rises up and challenges us to explore and re-examine the subtle sens sensibilities of objects as paintings offer another view of the dynamic and unpredictable swirl of life unrestrained. I will go back again and see the show and to see what, if what I experienced the first time will continue to offer a deeper and richer aesthetic experience for this reason alone. In a word, the work succeeds. And these are my impressions. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you. That was a lot to think about. It, it's a treasure. Thank you. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. And I think we all will. <laughs> thank you. So our next speaker is Herlinda. And well, the last of the four that I invited. And Herlinda is a, a wonderful printmaker and painter. And um, 
go ahead, Herlinda, join us. You might be muted. Noah, do you see her, Linda? You know, I'm not seeing her, Dad. Oh, darn. She had trouble connecting before? She did, but she, um, yeah, Paul. Um, so perhaps, Noah, Noah, I will, um, no, let's introduce Julie and then uh, Ellen and I will try to reach her, Linda, and see what's going on. Okay. Uh, so Julie, Julie McRae, <laughs> who we are deeply indebted to uh, because it's Julie's gallery. And I thank you so much, Julie. And uh, this was perfect and a very special uh thanks to you for all of this you know it, it was my pleasure and thank you for thank you so much for sharing this beautiful work with us i mean it it feels like it was almost made for the space um as fawad was saying it just there's a movement that happens with all of this work together that it is being like it's like being in currents of a stream as you walk around the gallery it, it kind of keeps pushing you or moving you or swaying you back and forth between pieces so thank you very much for allowing us to show the beautiful work um and i wanted to thank you sandy and i also wanted to thank our speakers today um hopefully herlinda will be able to come back on at some point but uh thank you guys for for putting in the time and coming through and just sharing with us because to hear each of you speak about the pieces, to me, that's a real gift. Okay, now it's on you, Judge Tom. Okay, give us one second. Why we got you? Okay. Go on mute and let her. Julie, let's come back to you, okay? I think we got her, Linda. I think Noah, you got it under control. Her, Linda, can you? Uh, hello? I'm right here. Perfect. Can you hear me? We can, yes. If you, right next to your mute, if you want to click your uh, video, we'll be able to see you. It said we'll okay, say start see. video. Okay, video right there. Ah, uh, perfect. So we're uh, looking at your brooch right now. We're uh, through the camera next to your computer. Okay. Perfect. Okay, finally. Shall I start? Yes, please. Yes. Um, hello, everybody. Um, what I would like to do is uh, focus just on two works in the exhibition. And the first one has already been introduced by Sandy. It is the tree earth, which I think is magnificent. And when you first see it, you really just see the uh, brush strokes. And it's later on that it seems like the tree grows right out of it. And these two levels of seeing both, you know, the abstract and the medium and the representation always makes me think of these uh, fishes that I once saw at the uh, uh, aquarium in uh, San Francisco. And these fishes had four eyes. They had two sets of eyes, one to look at everything below the water and the other uh, looking above the water. And uh, I think these two visions are very, very much connected to modernism that always foregrounds the medium. But it also happens in very older work. You know, I remember standing in front of Grunewald, the uh, big crucifixion in Kul Kulmar, which is magnificent, and uh, looking at the hand where, you know, the nail was pounded through the flesh and into the wood with great force. But when you think of the medium, the painter had to use the smallest of brushes and almost tenderly caress the linen in order to create that illusion. And so these two levels are always playing around in art, uh, whether it's modern art or older art. And so what is really beautiful about this particular work, tree earth, is that there's such a soft fusion between the brush strokes and the imagery of the tree, so that it's as if the tree grows out of the brush strokes and the forest floor um, sort of melts into these brush strokes. 
And uh, I think it is typical for a lot of the work of uh, Sandy. And then the second uh, work that I want to tackle is this uh, um, raft of Medusa. Um, it, is, it is so big, it almost doesn't fit into the uh, gallery. And while the raft of Medusa is always seen as uh, the epitome of romanticism because of the extreme emotions uh, on the raft, but it's also a very classical painting. And so the composition of the painting is primarily, you follow all of the hands that point towards the ship that might save them. Uh, and on the right hand side, on the left hand side, you have this big wave that is about to engulf the raft. Um, and you have this figure of uh, the one man who is sitting at the very edge uh, mourning about his son. Um, and so I think that um, that same uh, left and right, the, the right is much brighter uh, in Sandy's work and there's much more linens showing through, but there is a real darkness that dominates almost the entire canvas to the left. And now what, what uh, um, Jericho has done with the uh, characters is he's focused on the 15 that survived. He's actually made 18 out of them. And what Sandy has done, he has really reduced them to what looks like two figures, one to the right to the lighter area and another one to the left in the darker area. And they really capture on the one hand, the hope of these characters that are thinking they're going to be rescued. And the other one is like a blue figure almost at the very edge to the left of the canvas, drowning in the brushstrokes, dark blue and dark black. And so I think what is going on, this is my reading, is that, yes, it is a political painting, but it's also a very personal uh, painting because these two figures, you know, are like an inner landscape. And it's like, we cannot depict what is within us. It's a morass. Uh, we always have to go through the outside world through metaphor uh, in order to convey what is within. And so I think these two uh, elements, these two figures, uh, of hope and despair uh, do that. It's also called I am the raft of uh, uh, the Medusa, which doesn't mean like I am the one who's rifting on a big painting, but it's more like that raft with its emotions is also part of me. And so uh, I think that uh, a lot of great works of art have all these layers. It's really like a seven layer cake with frosting. And so the frosting is what we usually take away. Uh, it's what popularizes uh, a painting, but it's all of these different layers of meaning that allow a painting to, to, to exist through the centuries and appeal to new sensibilities. And uh, I remember myself seeing um, a painting by Monet uh, of uh, a uh, weeping willow and I'd seen it before, it didn't mean much to me, but when I saw it at the Marmotte in uh, Paris, I could see there is this, this surge of black in the middle of the canvas, and then all of these delicate uh, branches with these twisting leaves. And I suddenly realized that what he's doing is that he's giving you the two extremes of that tree, but they belong together, they are part of the spectrum. And I think for me, that is what I see in, in Sandy's work is that these two figures that are suggested are this character of hope and this character of despair. They belong together. They, they are the, the spectrum and the uh, part of the, that every artist actually uh, understand. It's, it's this pendulum between, well, first of all, I don't think that we are worried about our life and dying, but an artist worries about the fate of the work. And so you have in this character of hope um, that is brightly painted in Sandy's uh, work, you have this sense of uh, moments that we have in the studio where everything is just going supreme and where that uh, inner inner uh, well gives rise to work um, effortlessly. And that we believe that that well will always replenish and that will always be new. Whereas there is also probably more days where we are that little character in Sandy's work that is dark and blue and almost submerged, uh, which is a world of doubt and of questions. And so um, for, I think from an artist's perspective, it is a very personal work and it's almost a confessional. 
and the upper layers may be more political, but to me, that is how I take the work home. I have known Sandy since the mid eighties and I've always liked his work. And I think the work has depth and daring. Thank you. Linda, wow, thank you so much. And I'm so touched with how you see my work and thank you for that. And we're gonna, we're, I'm not, I don't know what to say. I don't wanna comment on anybody's, that was great, thank you. And, and we're gonna have a chance to respond after all four of you have not spoken. And I wanna go back to Julie for a minute um, and let her say more. And uh, then we're gonna have some Q and A and some, some comments. So thank you, Herlinda. <clears throat> and um, maybe I could say just at this point in regards to all four of you that spoke, that was, that's incredible quality you offered. And I, I wanna <clears throat> say, and you know this too, Julie, that we're recording this and thank goodness we're recording this because the things that were said were so substantive and meaningful on many levels. And uh, so I'm, I'm really touched by that. And I wanna to add too, that <clears throat> for all of you that are listening or watching that, this is an expression of the incredible depth and quality of the art community that we live in out here. So Julie, <laughs> speak. Hello again. <laughs> so um, again, thank you everyone for um, the wonderful words that you've said and for the different perspectives and insights. Um, to me, that's a huge gift because, you know, I'm in the gallery, lucky me, I'm in the gallery every day getting to see this. And when I get somebody else's, I think for all of us, when we get someone else's perspective, when we hear somebody else's feelings or thoughts or perceptions on a work, we get to look at the work again with totally new eyes and see something that maybe we didn't catch before or reevaluate our own thoughts on a work. So I really appreciate it. And I kind of, I look at it as a gift, the words that you guys have given. And Sandy, again, thank you for having your work here. Um, as he said, this is being recorded. So we're gonna put this up um, on the gallery YouTube channel. Um, and I don't know if Sandy's also gonna send this out, but you'll have a chance to, to look it over again if you'd like or to share it. Um, and the show is going to be up through the 27th. So if you haven't seen it, or if you would like to see it again, please come and enjoy. We are being very good about socially distancing. Um, and I always have my mask on here, except that now nobody else is here. So um, anyway, thank you guys so much. And now we're going to turn it over to Noah, who is going to be our master of questions and Zoom. Um, and he'll take it from here. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Julie. And yes, thanks to everyone who spoke. I, I also am, am totally moved by that and am just impressed with the depth of commentary and the, the art community uh, that um, you all are a part of and we all are a part of. So thanks to everybody. Um, yeah, so look, at, we, we, this doesn't need to be formal. Um, two ways that you could comment or ask a question of anyone who spoke or anyone who's on the line or Sandy um, is to just uh, shout it out. Although of course that could get a little hectic or um, post a, a question in the chat and we'll uh, try to facilitate there. And we'll, we'll keep this going for a, a few minutes here before, before signing off, but we'll just open up the floor right now. Don't be shy. Oh, I have a question. <laughs> Rosie. Dad, I'm wondering if there's one thing that you hoped people take away from your show, what this would be from this collection of your work. <laughs> Rosie, you asked a tough question. 
<laughs> first of all, one thing. <clears throat> the first thing that comes to my mind is depth of insight. Maybe I should stop right there. <laughs> what do you think? That's not fair. That's not part of the game. <laughs> oh, but good answer. It. Yeah, I haven't been there in person yet. Oh. <laughs> Depth of insight. Uh, Dad, uh, Jeff and Nina had a question for you, which is where you would rank Jericho in your pantheon of artists. That's a good question. I don't see Jeff and Nina, are they? But right here. Oh, great. There you are. Great to see you guys. All right. You, Andy. <laughs> I have, I'm glad you asked that question because I have a list of my greatest works, which I share with people. And actually, um, there are three at the top. The three greatest paintings, I think, are. Jericho's The Raft, yeah. Monet's Big Water Lilies at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, yeah. Yeah. and Jackson Pollock's One, which is also his big painting at the Museum of Art in New York. And I, I love the fact that you asked that because I'm prepared. I have a list of my favorite artists <laughs> beyond that. Can I share some of that with you? Please, uh, Please do. Um, yeah, absolutely. In yeah. terms of, you know, going down my list of favorite artists, the next one uh, <laughs> would be Rodin. Yeah. Rodin. Uh, probably Courbet in there. You know, that big hall of paintings at the Louvre. I mean, the huge yeah. Courbet. Yeah. yeah. And now I'm losing it a little bit because I, you know, I go gas. Who are we? Where are we coming from? You know, uh, which is in the Boston Museum. Yeah. Michelangelo. And then below that, Michelangelo's paintings and oh, uh, Michelangelo, the slaves or whatever. And then at the end of I switch over to rock art, art by people thousands of years ago. Yeah. So then you can ask me, well, what about Rembrandt. What? Rembrandt. <laughs> or women. Rembrandt. Wait a minute. So then you asked me, I, I didn't actually get that, but Rembrandt. Rembrandt. Oh, yeah, there's Rembrandt. He's good. <laughs> no, I love Rembrandt. But I was going to say, then you could ask me, well, those are all historic. So what about artists that are alive and or are recent or are not? part of that pantheon. And my list start, starts with Joan Brown, um, go, uh, who's not living, but a Bay Area artist who I'm very interested in. Uh, Kentridge, the South, South African artist, I think he's fantastic. And he combines uh, performance also, which um, I'm... Uh, I've lived with Ellen in that world and I am in awe of some of his work. And then a Marlena du Dumas, the uh, South African painter who lives in Amsterdam. Um, in New York, Catherine Bradford, like her work a lot. Kiki Smith. And then I wanna mention uh, a dear friend who's up there for me and he's not living, but um, uh, Tom Green, a Washington DC artist who was a dear friend and whose work is great and not yet fully recognized. So at any rate, that's a list. Uh, Jeff and Nina, did I? Yeah. Say it again. Yes, thank you, Sandy. That was great. You got it? <laughs> great to see you guys. Great to see I'm you here. Guys. Yeah, thank you. Noah, are there other questions or are we running out of time? We're, we're coming to the end of our hour, but I don't think we have to stop right on the hour. Um, but uh, yeah, any other questions or There's Kate. your reactions? Um, Hi, Sandy. Yeah. Hi, There's everyone. <laughs> um, Sandy, obviously I haven't seen you and Ellen in for a long time. <laughs> Uh, cause we're all shut in, but, um, 
so I haven't, uh, so I haven't been to the gallery. Did you create uh, the Medusa painting this past year or have you been working on it before then? Well, first thing is it's hard to say when a work of art for me begins and ends, Yeah, you know, from inception many years, but actually the, the date on the painting is more like, uh, um, I think, uh, uh, 2014, 2016, and it was, you know, an expression of just how our time was, you know, yeah. all the time since the World Trade Center and actually until, and perhaps until now, and certainly up until the election in November, it was still just as vital. Yeah. That answer. Andy, I was... I'm also interested, sorry to interrupt. Um, no, no. I've been so curious about how artists have been uh, able to work or not work during this past year. Some people have been uh, just in a flurry of activity and some people have been treading water and hanging on for dear life, which is my category. And so I'm just curious about um, how it's been for you if you wanna talk about that. Well, actually, it's it's essentially been a good period for me where everything slowed down and I could spend much more time and quiet time in the studio. And I'd, I'd actually toss that question out to uh, my uh, guest speakers, too, Hearn, Fod, um, Janice, and, um, and Herlinda. Do any of you want to answer that question also? Maybe not. <laughs> um, well, I, there are a few more questions here. Uh, Ross, I think, has a question. Yes. Ross, I hope you won't mind. I'm going to uh, play a few pictures over you in re or over Sandy's answer in response to Heather's question, can we see the work slowly on Zoom? I hope you won't mind a little. Well, actually, I'm going to let you answer it, then I'm going to play it over. Dad. Sure. All right. You go first, Ross. OK. Um, uh, it's really been great to see all the show. And it inspires me to check in with my friend in Paris who is lamenting not being able to show his art. So I'm going to tell him to get on Zoom and create an art exhibit virtually. Uh, Sandy, uh, my question is, you said that in the 60s, you realized that your painting or your art was not addressing what you were thinking. And so you changed your artistic expression. And I'm wondering, um, how has your art uh, changed or evolved in how has your thinking changed with your artistic expression changing from the 60s onward? Has it facilitated or changed your thinking in some way or another? Well, I think that I felt, um, you know, that my expression was inadequate, uh, even though, you know, I was constantly um, conscious and listening and living you know, what was then for me kind of a revolutionary time. Yes. But somehow I couldn't bring the work in. So into, you know, my painting. So, I mean, that's what I was saying. And, and since then, of course, I constantly struggle with, you know, what I can do and what I have to say. And my work is not, uh, my work is political and I hope in a deeper sense and not uh, simply, you know, work about a particular moment and then it has no value beyond that. So I like to think that my work is political and I like to think that, uh, but, but, you know, I am not like a lot of the artists today, um, for, you know, for example, painting portraits of people who have been martyred or, um, various uh, war type situations in itself because I'm, I personally am hoping to make a statement that goes beyond the moment and deals with the, the deep issues that cause these things. I don't know if that helps you, but. That's great. <laughs> yeah, beyond, yeah, beyond the moment for a more universal um, uh, addressing the, the, the perennial issues, not the momentary issues. Yeah. That's what I hope for, Ross. It may be pretentious, but I try. No, no, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. Thank you, friend. Thank you. 
Dad, um, Julie McRae asks, do you feel your expression changes with your different mediums, paint versus woodblock versus drawings? A simple answer, Julie, is no. <laughs> That may not, you may not be what you wanted to hear, Julie, but, and I would say also that my work in performance, which I have a history of working with Ellen, you know, is it, continuous with that also. And that's a, so it's another medium, but other than that, it's just another medium. And sometimes one medium suits better an expression than another, sometimes, uh, you know, also scale and so forth. You know, for me, that's where it comes from. Um, frankly, I don't paint uh, work that I think is gonna go somewhere. I paint work and hope it's gonna go somewhere. <laughs> anyway. Um, Dad, we're gonna do, I think, uh, three more questions here. Um, so Steve asks, how did Dorland Mountain Arts Center in uh, work? <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Ooh, I know who you are, but I haven't met you. We've had some exchanges because Dorland, there's a artwork that we haven't been mentioning in the show, which is um, a folio, what I call a folio, um, based on the prose poem by Tamiki Hara, and I don't know, know if we have any representation of that, but, um, and that's a work that I want, started 25 years ago in the sense that it was uh, uh, conceived of during the um, 50th anniversary of uh, the bombing of Hiroshima. And uh, Ellen and I were working together on performance around that. And I was reading and I read uh, this very, very, for me, very moving, what I would call a prose poem by a Japanese poet who had survived the bombing of Hiroshima. And he wrote this five years after it. And it's, to me, it was a very moving and deep uh, poem. And I wanted to do something with it, image and uh, text. And I didn't know how to do that. And somewhere along the line, one, I wanna say one dark night, I was able to create the images, but I still didn't know how to put it together with the text. And I was fortunate enough to get to go to Dorland, the mountain uh, artist residency in, um, a year ago, January, and I had just a very few days there and I took the project with me and I was able to realize and finalize it with the exception of then it needed to be reproduced in order to be a multiple. So I had, I made the original with the, what was an incredible retreat at Dorland, which is a fabulous artist colony. Um, outside of Temecula, uh, which is perhaps you know, between say San Diego and Riverside. Anyway, I hope that answers the question. It, it was a great gift to me and uh, I was able to complete it and I'm very happy and I hope that uh, you all can see that work to take some time and read and go through it at the gallery. Um, perfect, thank you, Dad. Um, so no, I have a question. He, oh, yeah, go ahead, Robert. Oh. How do you send a chat? I'm sorry, I wasn't there. Um, yeah. How do you I'm send sorry. it? Say everything's okay, but come up here. I didn't, I was online. It's Noah, okay. you're on mute. Oh, my goodness. It's in the lower right hand corner in the more buttons. You'll see the chat there. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. Uh, I meant to call you for, to see this whole thing, but I, it started at five, not six. And I just. Um, I, Yes. How do you yeah. send the chat? Uh, well, you've, got, you've, you've already been successful, Heather. No, no, the man was asking. Uh, no, was. Robert. Oh, yeah, yes. just go to go to the chat. It's uh, it's quick in the chat, and it should come up for you, and then there'll be a place to write to everyone in the chat. And you push enter. 
on your first answer? I, think, I don't know if that was the question, really. That's it, correct. Return, I don't know if he's asking return your question. on your keyboard. Yeah. It, it return really on really your works. keyboard. But we could also just let him say his question yeah, but just and but avoid that whole problem. I was going to say. Um, let's, while we're working on yes. that, we're getting, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this is uh, Robert Bruce. Um, yeah. I was thinking for a future event, I would suggest we stroll through um, some of the other pictures uh, and be allowed to ask questions or make comments. I found the four responders that Sandy invited to be very powerful speakers and really opened this body of work for me in a way that uh, it would not have happened without them. So I thank you. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> thank you. I mm -hmm. thank them too. That, that is such a wonderful comment. Um, if you're interested, we, we, get, we have a link and we put it in the chat, but we can send it out uh, to access the images uh, through Dropbox for, for anybody who's able to do that. Not the same as being in the gallery, but um, that is uh, a, gr a great point, a great suggestion, and also a great comment. Um, uh, Dan, I'm gonna ask two, so we saw two more here. One from Eli, who asks, what might be some of the modern approaches or styles to abstract art by other artists that have caught your eye and influenced some of your more recent work? Uh, <laughs> Dad, sorry, you're on mute. Uh, you just got muted, apologies. Oh, I thought yeah, it was yeah. on, can you hear me? Yeah, you're good, yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, so the, the only thing I can say is what I'm looking at right now, which is the work of Clifford Still, and I could maybe leave it at that, the answer to that question. Clifford Still is not living, but I think it, you know, is in the range of what he's talking about. <laughs> okay. Um, well, listen, uh, no one has to go home. Noah, this. Noah, can I interrupt you? Janice yeah. has her hand up. Oh, go Janice. We can't hear you, Janice. Well, here, I was just responding to Kate's, your question that Kate asked, which is, thank you for asking. And maybe other people have comments too on how you did in the last year. Was the year of solitude to your advantage or uh, did it make you crazy? And I feel like uh, every, everybody has an opportunity to really think about that right now a year in so i would say to sandy you know how long has this show been gestating and what impact did uh uh our year of isolation have on the work or on the current work that you're working on um and was it in the way or did it free you <laughs> should i answer that janice <clears throat> or, i wouldn't mind <clears throat> the others <clears throat> that spoke, but I'll just say, this show was primarily complete, <clears throat> we, you know, before COVID hit, <clears throat> and I'm on to uh, a new body of work. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so could, I, could we ask the other speakers to respond? And I'll give you my response first, yeah. because it was, I went from, uh, for the first time in February of last year, I resigned from being an employee in a nonprofit organization and kind of just put myself out to pasture. And uh, it was very scary not having the structure. And I think I went into a deep tunnel first, but I came out of it when a colleague said to me, this is your sabbatical. This is your time to do your creative work. Um, and I just turned my head around and said, okay, I'm at an artist retreat. It's called my house. Um, and I have a backyard where I can ponder and think it was beautiful. And out of that came projects that I'm working on now a year later um, that I would have probably needed the time to really think about where I wanna put my energies. So it's really had its own blessing. 
Um, so there's two film projects I'm working on and one essay. So it's it's been good in, in its bad way. Yeah. I'm curious to know about other people. Well, I could jump in, I guess, if nobody else is ready to say anything. I, I think it's been a very special time in my work to have the isolation and the concentration. But uh, as things have happened, you know, the, the, um, the, the time just seems to merge together. I look back and think, how long has this been? And I really can't pin down any landmarks of events or, or tell if I've made progress. Sometimes we know in a journey, you know, you've seen something and now I see something else and I feel like I don't know. I may have been going in circles for this past year and just enjoyed being in the studio and working. So I don't really have a, I don't know yet. I think we'll, we'll need a little more time to go out, but, uh, but, but certainly I'm, I'm a person who enjoys being by myself in the studio. So it's been uh, ideal in that point of view. How about you, Fod and then Herlinda, would you like to say? Yeah. Can you hear me? We hear you. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> okay. For me, it's been magnificent. That year somehow sharpened my focus in the studio tremendously, primarily because you suddenly had this blank calendar that didn't fritter away your time. And the way I work in the studio, I often need blocks of three to four days to finish a piece. And the second thing that happened was that I was ready for this period. It was like the vocabulary in my own work was just right for being extended to a larger issue. And so it came together with an invitation to show um, at the Montreux Art Museum and so for me, that one year uh, just brought everything together. And I have promised myself not to fritter away my time anymore, to put everything together like on a Monday and keep the rest of the week open if I can. So, um, I mean, not to diminish uh, the pain that this caused for a lot, but for me, it was very beneficial. Thank you, Erlinda and Fod. Can you tell us, Bob, are you there? Maybe we lost Bob. He doesn't want to answer that question. But no, we, I know we've run over and, you know, I don't want to keep people and this has been just great. And I have to thank you, Noah. You did a great job. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I totally agree. It's been wonderful. And, and as I was starting to say what, a minute ago, we, the conversation can continue. No reason that it has to end, but we will close uh, the formal, I guess, formal Q&A part of this. But, um, but Dad, there is a, a question that I think is appropriate. Uh, you can take however you want in the context of this year uh, to close this out in the context of, of all of us being on a raft uh, as it may be. Um, Ella asks, in what is a, a terrific uh, final question, uh, Sandy, what keeps you going? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking that, but I can't help myself. I, you know, it frankly, Art early on saved my life and it keeps feeding me. I love art and it's it's like a flow that comes out of me and I trust it will continue. Um, so I hope that answers Ella. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. Agreed. Well, thank, thank you to everybody. Thank you to does you, Dad, your congratulations, and thank you to Julie uh, for a wonderful show. We can't wait to visit in person for those of us who are not uh, immediately in the Bay Area, or at least can visit the gallery. Um, I'll keep this running, but thanks to everyone who attended and, uh, and spent some time with all of us this evening, um, and we'll look forward to seeing you all again soon, I hope.
Thanks for the opportunity to talk. Thank you. Thanks, Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. Bravo. Congratulations, Sandy. Thank that you. was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. Nancy. Thank you all are welcome. Oh, wonderful. Robert Charles. <laughs> Thank you. This has been just a, a joy to be with you all and hear all your comments. Damn, hi. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Oh, yes. Good job, Noah. Uh, Steve Rickard here. And uh, thanks for all the St. Albans uh, graduates who, who signed in. We're, we're lucky to have, he's a star of our class. <laughs> Don't say that. With your all stars, and thank you, Steve. <laughs> and we're all beneficiaries of Steve Stamball, too. That's true. Yes. Well, I've been trying to figure out if I can take a plane to uh, Berkeley. <laughs> yeah, come visit for the weekend. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Share the screen. Oh, yes. Marvelous. Beautiful nice painting. painting, Nancy, in the back. <laughs> oh, hey, Allison. 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 Nice wow. Hey. Hi, Ellen. Hi, <laughs> hey, Allison. And Sandy, beautiful painting. Nice to see everyone. Yeah. yeah. Did you see Noah's baby? <laughs> yes. <laughs> beautiful. Uh. He looks like this. <laughs> Any time, everybody. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to end the Zoom. Thanks to everyone. Have a great Thank rest. Bye bye. Hi, congratulations. Thank you, Noah. Bye. Thank you, Sandy. Bye, everyone. Bye. Julie. Bye. bye.